So it's my great pleasure today to introduce uh, Radhika Subramanian from um, uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, Department of Molecular Biology and Harvard Med School Department of Genetics, where she's an assistant professor. And so Radhika and I overlapped in the Gellis lab at Brandeis, um, where she was a graduate student and I was a postdoc and we were, we were just reminiscing. So I think Radhika was the, um, the last graduate student Jeff had work on kinesin, um, which many of you may know was um, Jeff's initial claim to fame uh, were his studies on, on kinesin motility. And she was um, also at the time, <laughs> Brandeis, I, I think Radhika and I both have very fond memories of, of Brandeis. It was kind of in many ways a scientific kind of utopia because there were, I think three labs in our own building, COSAL. Um, for those of you who are familiar with it, it was Liz Hedstrom's lab, the Gellis lab and Melissa Moore's lab. And um, so it's a pretty close knit uh, community. And, um, um, you know, it was full of quirks and, and one quirk um, we were saying is I think Radhika was probably the final student in the Gellis lab to record her data on VHS tapes, which for, for the graduate students in the audience are these pieces of plastic about <laughs> this big that contain a, a magnetic piece of uh, film uh, between them and you insert them into something called a VCR player, <laughs> video cassette recorder, and you can um, record movies off them. And um, that was originally how, uh, um, a lot of microscopy data was recorded. And I, and I remember uh, you could overlay the, the computer monitor with transparency film and then to plot the, the motion and uh, trajectories on the, on the monitors off of the, um, the VHS recordings. But um, the other thing I remember is that I think Radhika and I both enjoyed while we were in the Gellis lab uh, giving Jeff's longtime staff scientist Larry a hard time, <laughs> um, but it was done. It was done with a lot of affection. Um, so, so after Radhika um, uh, graduated with her PhD from Brandeis, she went to Rockefeller to do a, a postdoc in Tarun Kapoor's lab, which was wildly successful. Um, I just learned that her baymate was Emily Foley, who some of you may now know from her job as a SRO at the NIH, particularly if you have an R35 grant. Um, but uh, during that time, um, Radhika kind of continued her, her, her scientific trajectory by not focusing just on the motor proteins, but also thinking about the tracks that those motor proteins work on. And she's expanded that into her own lab um, where she's studying really interesting biology and really interesting biochemistry at the intersection of motor proteins and the, the networks these motor proteins construct and deconstruct and move on inside cells. And with that, I'll, I'll let uh, Radhika take it away. And, and thank you for agreeing to give the seminar. Yeah, thank you, Aaron, for the invitation. And uh, I sort of feel like one of the, the, the best sort of parts of like, you know, science life is uh, visiting different places and giving uh, uh, giving seminars and in the process like meeting uh, friends from uh, graduate school and the postdoc time and sort of reminiscing about all the all the good stuff and all the weird stuff and everything else and I'm really like sad not to be there in person today but uh, I'm happy to to share some of the new uh, some of some new stories from the lab. Um, that we are currently working on. So, okay. So I uh, I told my uh, I'm sorry I'm having some issues with my pointer. I just need to figure out what's going. On. Okay. Um, so I, I remember like telling my PhD advisor, Jeff Gellis at the end of my PhD that I, you know, I was so done with microtubules. I never wanted to see them again. And uh, clearly, you know, never say never because here I am uh, still working on, on microtubules, but, uh, and exploring different aspects of microtubule biology. 
So the inspiration and, uh, you know, for, for all the work that we do, uh, and that gets me excited about, comes from these beautiful pictures from uh, our cell biology textbooks. Um, and, and everything green on this slide is microtubules. And what I, what the take home message from these images is that, you know, microtubules organize into very diff different uh, architectures for different cellular functions. So for example, in neurons, microtubules have very distinct architecture in axons and dendrites. Similarly, ciliated cells have microtubules that are organized into axonemes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a bit. And then very close to my heart in dividing cells, microtubules organize into what I think is one of the most beautiful like cellular machinery, the mitotic spindle. All of these uh, structures are built from a common building block, which is the, which is a microtubule polymer, which is a polymer of alpha and beta tubulin uh, that is uh, organized into a hollow cylinder. So the question that uh, we are interested in is how do these nanometer size building blocks, which are like tubulin and associated proteins that organize microtubules give rise to structures that are much, much larger in size. Or in other words, how do you go from uh, nanometer sized uh, uh, proteins to micron sized arrays? How do you build these structures and how do you destroy these structures? And what are the mechanisms underlying these processes? Uh, so in my lab, we specifically focus on two biological problems. So the first one is the spindle and anaphase that uh, plays a role in directing the cell division machinery. Uh, and the second one is, uh, it's sort of a new direction that I started when I started my lab, which is ciliated cells and particularly primary cilium in the context of hedgehog signaling. So today's talk will be in two parts. I will mostly talk about this uh, new story from my lab um, that I would love to get feedback on where we are trying to understand the role of the cytoskeleton in a developmental process, uh, hedgehog signaling. And uh, part two is a sort of, a, it started as a really fun project that now I'm very like, uh, you know, this is just something we just, we just wanted to try and we tried it and now we are very excited about what we can do with AFM. So I would like to share some of the new data from that study with you. So uh, starting with the first part of the talk, uh, I'm going to be telling you about psyllium dependent hedgehog signaling and a step in that pathway that we are trying to work out. But before I talk about hedgehog, hedgehog signaling and microtubules and all of that, I want to take a step back and just uh, you know, go back to the last step of any signal transduction pathway, which is, the, which is gene activation. And when I think of transcription and when I think of transcription factors, and, and I must admit, I don't think about these things often enough, I think of the nucleus. And because I was giving a talk and Aaron is in the audience, I even have splicing in there. Uh, so, so this is you know, the view of transcription factor in the, in the nucleus. But really, there is a lot of fine regulation of transcription factors in the cytoplasm. And some of the best understood mechanisms are those that involve the membrane, such as Golgi and, and ER-based mechanisms, where transcription factors are held and then uh, activated and released uh, to enter the nucleus at the right time uh, in, 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 in a given process. But in addition to these membrane, membrane stra scaffolds that uh, regulate transcription factors, the other major scaffold in a cell is, is of course the cytoplasm, cytoskeleton, which forms these long polymeric structures uh, that, that, are, uh, that, that, that can act as platforms for different cellular processes. There are a few examples now on of how transcription factors are uh, localized to uh, cytoskeletal proteins. 
and, and, and but the link between cytoskeleton and transcription factor regulation is very poorly understood at a mechanistic level. And so I got interested in this question in the context of the primary cilium, uh, because it, in the last two decades, it has become very clear that this tiny cellular organelle, so this organelle is less than a micron in diameter and just a few microns long, is, a, is, is, is turning out to be a, a major hub of cellular signaling. Uh, and, and of course, the backbone of the structure is made up of a microtubule array known as the axoneme. And uh, th this, 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 it turns out that this small microtubule-based organelle is absolutely critical for hedgehog signaling in vertebrates. So what is the hedgehog signaling pathway? I'm just going to give you like a very, very broad and brief introduction. So it's a major developmental pathway. Uh, it, it plays essential roles in tissue patterning during em embryo uh, development. And it also has mitogenic roles. Uh, this includes proliferation during adult tissue homeostasis. And as you can imagine, errors in the signaling pathway uh, lead to uh, multiple uh, disorders uh, that are developmental, but they're also associated with numerous uh, cancers. So of course, I got interested in this pathway because of its dependency on the cilia and trying to understand what is the link between hedgehog signaling and the, and, and, and the microtubule cytoskeleton per se. So uh, I'm just going to tell you about one step of the pathway, and this is the very last step of the pathway. So uh, as I mentioned, the last step of any signal transduction is of course uh, gene expression. And uh, the major effector of the hedgehog pathway is this transcription factor called GLI. It is glioma associated oncogene. And when the hedgehog pathway is off, GLI is localized to the base of the cilium where it is turned off. When the pathway turns uh, on, uh, GLI translocates to the very tip of the cilium. And there are processes here that we don't understand. It's a little bit of a black box, but GLI is activated at the tip of the cilium. And then it travels back out of the cilium and then it enters the nucleus uh, where it transcribes uh, genes. So, so there are these very distinct microtubule localizations of this transcription factor leading to the question of what is this role of the cytoskeleton in GLI regulation? Is it a placeholder? If it is a placeholder, how is it forming the placeholder? And is there more to it than just being a, a spot where GLI lands for other downstream functions? So we just wanted to, to begin to understand the links here. Um, and the entry point for us was uh, a ciliary kinase in KIP7. So this, the discovery of this kinesin in 2009 by three different labs actually was very exciting because finally there was a molecular link bet between the hedgehog effector proteins and uh, the microtubule-based uh, cilium. So at the molecular level, this seemed to be a good starting point to, to start thinking about the roles of the cytoskeleton in hedgehog signaling. So KIP7 is a conserved protein in the hedgehog pathway. Um, and what we know about KIP7 is that, as you can see in this immunofluorescence image, when, uh, when the pathway is activated by the small molecule called SAG in, in our tissue culture experiments, uh, GLI, the transcription factor, like localizes to the very tip of the cilium and KIP7 also localizes to the same place. In the absence and in vitro experiments from my lab that we published uh, last year uh, shows that KIF7 is a not motile kinesin. So when the, when the kinesin was discovered as being part of this pathway, it was the first sort of model or the hypothesis was, oh, it must be a transport protein that carries the transcription factor to the tip of the cilia. And so we did some in vitro experiments and we showed that it is a non-motile kinesin but it can track the ends of a growing microtubule. So in the image below, I hope you can see the, the, the green comet decorating the end of a microtubule. 
Uh, and it turns out that, uh, and we worked out the mechanism of this in this paper, which shows that KIF-7 has increased affinity for the GTP form of tubulin at microtubule ends. So what happens when KIF-7 is missing from cells? So what we find is that when KIF-7 is absent, GLE no longer properly localizes to the very tip of the cilia, but instead is localized all along the axoneme in these uh, puncta. So it leads to mislocalization of GLE2, and that seems to affect both pathway activation and pathway repression in terms of transcription readout. And finally, there were uh, experiments published back in 2009 where, where uh, multiple groups had also shown that perhaps GLE and KIF7 directly bind each other based on pull down experiment from tissue lysates. And we wanted to, to, to take a, a deeper look into this, this question of is this kinesin really a transcription factor binding protein? And if so, how does it bind the transcription factor? Because there are not a not, lot of known examples of this cargo motor interaction. So this is the work of a postdoc in the lab, Swara Huck, and a postdoc student who is now uh, moved on to a graduate, to move down to graduate school, Christian, who together worked on this question of understanding how these two proteins uh, bind each other. So uh, the, the, both of these proteins are very large proteins. And so we, 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 we had our first technical problem when we tried to express and purify them. So we decided to take a step back and just look at domain-domain interactions by doing co-immunoprecipitations co uh, by overexpression of these domains in XP293 cells. And we got our first surprise when we went on, on the Glee side when we found that the zinc finger domain, now this is the DNA binding domain of the transcription factor is the one that is involved in binding the kinesin. On the kinesin end, it turns out that the first coil coil domain, so this is the dimerization domain. So kinesins have a motor domain connected to a small neck linker. And these two motor domains get, two motor domains get dimerized by a small coil coil domain. And this is followed by a large cargo binding domain. And it turns out that it's, it's this very small coil coil domain made up of about 40 amino acids that forms the glee binding site in this complex. So we wanted to see what kind of a complex they form and whether we could actually purify the complex. And so we conducted some binding assays where we, uh, where we found that the zinc finger of Glee forms a very tight complex with KIF7 coil coil domain with a KD of about 50 nanomolar. We are able to isolate these complexes and we can also determine the stoichiometry. And what we learned was that one KIF7 coil coil dimer binds to one molecule of the Glee zinc finger. Now a Glee zinc finger is made of like five zinc finger repeats and I'll show you a structure of that. So basically the five zinc finger uh, domains in this tandem repeat uh, bind one coil coil dimer. So how does this actually uh, work? So uh, we, we, we were fortunate to have a structure of KIF7 bound to, sorry, Glee bound to DNA from Nikola Pavlitich's uh, work. And essentially Glee, the Glee zinc fingers. Now, every 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 helix in this uh, in this pink structure that you see on the screen is a part of a zinc finger, and there are five of these. And the zinc fingers clasp around the double-stranded DNA, sort of holding the DNA uh, in this conformation that's seen in the structure. And then we look when we model the KIF7 coil coil based on numerous coil coil structures that are available in the structure database. Uh, and, and, you know, it didn't seem unreasonable that the size and the shape of a coil coil of this lens is, is quite similar to double stranded DNA. So then we, we looked into this a little bit more carefully and we looked at the electrostatics of, of the between DNA and Glee that form the interaction. And it turns out that, that Glee has a very positively charged a C-shaped structure that then clasps a very negatively charged DNA molecule. 
And so we looked at the electrostatic surface of the KIP7 coil coil, and it turns out that it is a highly negatively charged rod-like structure. So in principle, it, it essentially looks like a piece of DNA from a charge and size and shape perspective. So we, we then went ahead and modeled the complex. And when we, when we did that, we, our, our best fit model was the one where essentially the zinc finger clasped around a double uh, 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 a coil coil the same way as it clasps around a double stranded DNA in, in the structure of the transcription factor with DNA. And in this slide, I've, I've shown a comparison of the two, two, two structures. Okay. So, so this is a structural modeling work. So we wanted to then go ahead and test this model more rigorously. And I'm just going to show you two, two things that we did. Uh, so one of them was extensive site-directed mutagenesis that validates the model, but also helps us to, to uh, definitively place the zinc finger on the coil coil. The coil coil is highly negatively charged throughout, but we find that it is in this very specific region that the complex formation occurs. And the other thing we learned from this was that the residues in the zinc finger that are involved in DNA binding are also required for KIP7 binding. So if we mutate those specific residues, then the interaction is lost. So next, we wanted to directly test if there is a competition between DNA and the KIF7 coil coil. So or in other words, or do these two molecules bind the same site on the GLE2 zinc finger? So this is a competition as a black is the curve, binding curve between KIF7 and GLE in the absence of DNA. When we add in DNA, the entire curve shifts to the right and we only get binding once there is an excess of bleed. So this suggests that there is mutually exclusive binding of the KIP7 coil coil and DNA to the GLE2 zinc finger. So together, this suggests that this mode of interaction between a kinesin and uh, a transcription factor falls into this small category uh, known as DNA structural mimicry, which is a mechanism that has been recognized as a way to regulate DNA binding proteins. There are about 30 or 40 known so far or reported so far, but most of these are prevalent in bacteria and viruses. And they, as you can imagine, they play very interesting roles in evading host cell defense. And on the, on the screen is like one of my like favorite structures, which is uh, a protein from mycobacterium that pretends to be a DNA and inhibits a host DNA gyrase. Uh, in eukaryotes, there are very, very few examples, and they're typically nuclear localized. And so we think this is an example of DNA mimicry. Uh, uniquely, like the, the, the unique aspect of it is that it is a eukaryotic DNA mimicry mechanism, but that it happens in the cytoplasm. Uh, and it is a way of tethering perhaps a, a transcription factor to the cytoskeleton uh, in this case. So, so this is, uh, you know, the, the first part of this work led us to this sort of uh, um, insights into the mechanism by which these two proteins bind each other. Uh, but there was a question of, you know, what, what, do, what do these proteins, like can KIF7 actually recruit GLE2 microtubules? So we wanted to test that and we used a turf microscopy based assay to uh, do these experiments. So we immobilize microtubules on a glass surface. It's fluorescently labeled. Uh, and yes, I eventually graduated to doing fluorescence work in my postdoc. Uh, we label the KIP7 with uh, GFP and we, uh, we have the uh, zinc finger from the transcription factor labeled with uh, an Alexa dye. So we can visualize all three components in the system. And um, what we see here in this slide um, is you can see the microtubule channel and I'm showing you the GLE channel in the absence and presence of KIF7. And as expected, you can see that KIF7 is, um, is, is, is recruited to the microtubules uh, by Sorry, <laughs> so the transcription factor is recruited to the microtubules by the kinesin. So this is not unexpected, but it was nice to like see that this, this worked as expected. 
but the surprise came when we actually looked at the kinesin. And here now it's the same experiment, but now we are looking at the kinesin instead of the transcription factor. Uh, and as you can see, even in the absence of glee, there is KIP7 on the microtubules. But when we add glee, when we add the transcription factor, there is now a, an, an increase in the amount of KIP7 on microtubules. So what this says is that glee is not a passive cargo. It's not just that the, the kinesin sits on the microtubule and recruits glee. The glee, glee actually positively regulates the kinesin microtubule interaction and you can imagine that this will set up a positive feedback loop to concentrate both the transcription factor and the kinesin on microtubules uh, as, as would be beneficial for dynamically relocalizing these proteins to a particular uh, region of, of a cytoskeletal array. So we then looked at how this recruit, how this binding of KIF7 changes with uh, the concentration of glee. So now this is an experiment where we hold the concentration of KIP7 constant and we look at how much KIP7 is on microtubules with increasing amounts of glee. And you can see there's this dose dependent response that eventually saturates. So what this suggests is that the amount of KIP7 on microtubules depends on the amount of glee. And so this sets up a loop where there is now uh, a Basically, KIF7 is sensitive to the concentration of glee in solution, and, 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 and the, the, the readout is that both KIF7 and glee 2 concentrations can increase on microtubules in a dose-dependent manner sensitive to glee concentration. So, so how does this happen? How is it that the information from this coil-coil domain that is far away from the motor domain transmitted to the motor domain itself. So how does the binding to the coil-coil change the motor microtubule interaction? So this was a puzzle that took a really long time to solve and uh, the experiments here are like little complicated. So I'm just going to give you the answer here. So the first thing we checked was perhaps the glee binds the motor domain itself. Um, and the answer was no. In solution, there was no interaction between the motor domain and, and, and glee, uh, the coil-coil bound glee. Uh, when we have now a, a, a dimeric construct containing both the coil-coil and the motor domain, what we found was that there was not one, but two molecules of glee. So this was very confusing. So one site was where the coil-coil is, and then there is a second site, and we didn't know where it was going to be. And it turns out uh, that it is close to the motor site. Uh, and it's, it's formed by both the motor domains. Um, so what we found was that if we now take motor, so to test this, what we did was we took the motor domains and we concentrated them on microtubules. And now the same motor domain that was unable to bind glee in solution can recruit the transcription factor. So I'm happy to, to talk more about this later, but for now, I just want to give you what, what we think happens, which is that, in fact, KIP7 has two sites for glee binding. One is at the coil-coil, and, and one is uh, at the uh, formed by the motor domains of KIP7. So in order to be certain about this and, and, and really try and make sure that glee does touch the motor domain of KIP7, we collaborated with Ron Milligan's lab at Scripps, uh, and we uh, solved the cryo-EM structure of KIP7 bound to microtubules in the presence of glee. And uh, what we see is indeed there is now, we can clearly see glee bound to a motor. We cannot resolve the second interaction site on the second motor, but we can, we can we find that there are three zinc fingers that can be fit into this density. So, uh, so we, we had now, you know, so far what we had learned was that there were two sites on KIF7 for glee binding. So there is the coil-coil site and then there's the motor domain site. And we wanted to look at what the charge, sur charge surface of these sites looked like. And as you can see here, these are both highly negatively charged surface. And so KIF7 is involved in hedgehog signaling and glee binding. And we wanted to ask, you know, is this, um, 
you know, will we see this with every kinesin or, you know, or is this somewhat specialized? And to, to just begin to get at that question, we, we now looked at um, a kinesin that is a ciliary kinesin, a close homologue of KIP7, which is in fact thought to arise from a gene duplication event. Uh, and, and there are two kinesins, one is KIP7, the other is KIP27. KIF-27 does not bind GLI and it is not involved in hedgehog signaling. And when we look at the, uh, the, the structural models for KIF-27 coil, coil, and motor domain, we find that the charge uh, surface, electrostatic surface charge is, is completely different from KIF-7, even though they're both ciliary kinesins and very closely related. So we think that uh, the GLI binding sites uh, are, are specialized on KIF-7. Uh, but this also, you know, so, so, you know, it was, it was interesting to find the two sites, but then there was the question of, there is one side that's the coil coil and the other side, which is at the motor domain, which of these sites is, plays a role in this graded response of KIF7 uh, binding in the presence of Glee. So how, so which of these binding interactions is important to change the KIF7 microtubule uh, binding? So now that we have these two proteins, we could, we, could, we could play some chimera games and we could do some domain swapping. And that's what we did. Uh, so in this experiment, we took the coil coil from KIF-27 and we replaced it uh, in the KIF-7 protein so that we now have a motor that's KIF-7 and a coil coil that's KIF-27. And uh, this is the, the data, wild type protein data. So again, as you see, as they increase the GLI concentration, the amount of KIF7 on microtubule changes. So plotted on the y-axis is the KIF7 GFP intensity on microtubules. And with the chimera, we saw something that initially sort of surprised us and then we worked out what's going on. But essentially what we see is that if the KIF7 coil coil domain is missing, then the protein is constitutively strongly bound to microtubules and it can no longer be regulated by GLI. So it becomes GLI independent. It can still recruit GLI, but the amount of binding is independent of the transcription factor. So just to summarize this part of the talk, uh, we think there is a there are these, these two binding sites on the kinesin together set up a system that allows for synergistic accumulation of both KIF7 and GLI in response to, to GLI level. So it's sort of, you know, and, and can think of it as some kind of a rheostat-like system where the amount of GLI, the kinesin is sensitive to the amount of GLI and responds to GLI concentrations, which in turn then changes how much transcription factor is on the microtubules. Uh, so this was all in vitro, and we, uh, we, we wanted to ask the question, is the synergistic accumulation of GLI2 and KIF7 on microtubules relevant in cells? And also in the context of full length proteins, because all the in vitro work was done with uh, you know, smaller constructs that were more amenable to the biochemistry. So this is now a, a very simple heterologous overexpression experiment uh, in, in non-ciliated cells. So the top panel here uh, is, is a cell in which we've transfected GLI alone with a neon green tag. And you can see when you overexpress just the transcription factor, it, it is mostly localized to the nucleus. When you overexpress the uh, kinesin, uh, it, is, it, it localizes in this perinuclear fashion uh, in the in the cytoplasm, but when we co-express both the proteins, we see a very dramatic change, and both of these proteins now localize strongly to microtubules, and and GLI is out of the uh, nucleus. So this says that the synergistic accumulation of both proteins on the on the cytoskeleton is 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 something that can that is like seen with full length proteins in the cellular context. But that was a, you know, heterologous overexpression system. And, and what the real question was, does this matter for the ciliary localization? So just to like take a step back, what I had shown you in the introduction was, was this uh, data. 
where I had shown you that in wild type cells, uh, in the presence of the hedgehog activator, uh, both KIF7 and D are at the tip of the cilia. So that's the, uh, that, that's uh, color coded in red here and green is the protein signal. In the absence of KIF7, D is no longer at the tip of the cilia, but localized all along the axon. So what we wanted to ask was, but what our data told us was that this doesn't go one way, this goes the other way too. And it told us that if you, if you don't have Glee, then our data predicts that KIF7 would also not be at the tips of the cilia. So in order to, um, to test this, uh, we were very fortunate because uh, Rob Lipins Lipinski's group had made these cell lines that have uh, the different isoforms of Glee knocked out. And what I'm showing you here are immunofluorescence images where we did the immunofluorescence with directly labeled KIP7 um, antibody to, to try to do this as quantitatively as possible. Um, and in pink is KIP7 and, and in green is the axoneme and those are the two channels to really focus on. And you can see that when, when there is, when in the GLE2 null lines, uh, there is less KIF7, and in the GLE2, GLE3 null lines, there is basically no KIF7 at the cilia tip, and this is also something that we we can uh, show by quantification that, that this is indeed the case. So what this tells us is that this idea that the microtubule cytoskeleton is a platform and the kinesin on the microtubule is, is, is a site uh, form sort of a placeholder for recruiting the transcription factor is not entirely true. The transcription factor in turn actually regulates the cytoskeleton. So there is a, there is a, there's a feedback between the transcription machinery and the cytoskeletal uh, localization of the kinesin and this feedback loop is perhaps uh, it, it, it makes intuitive sense to me in, in the context of a signal transduction pathway where you want to very finely regulate the amount of proteins in a particular site at a particular time. So uh, we, so, so this was uh, just like something uh, we, 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 were, we were very surprised by our hydrologist expression experiment and, and how, how well it worked. And we said, okay, so that was with the full length protein. But can this small coil coil domain of KIF7, well, as I said, it's about like 45 amino acids or so, can it be used as a tool to regulate the nuclear localization of Glee? And why might one want to do that? Uh, one, uh, it might be, a, we, we are thinking of using this as a cell biological tool to move Glee around. And um, one can imagine like doing different types of experiments to tether glee to, to uh, outside of the nucleus wherever one wants to. And the uh, other context in, is, in, is in the cancer context where what is seen is that in a lot of different cancer types, there is overexpression of glee. And some of these happen through hedgehog pathway mediated uh, ways and some of them are hedgehog independent. So a direct way to inhibit glee would be advantageous. So we just well, we were just curious if this like small peptide would would even work. So this is just a proof of concept experiment, and this was essentially the experiment. We overexpressed glee uh, in the uh, with a with a fluorescent tag, and then we took this small coil coil and we put an ER tag on it, and we asked, can this small construct uh, sequester glee? in the cytoplasm or can it like bring it, basically prevent it from entering the nucleus? And to our surprise, the answer, maybe it's not a surprise in retrospect, but we were very excited when this actually worked. Uh, so what I'm showing you here are images. Uh, the top panel shows glee overexpression alone. And as you can see, it's in the nucleus. But then when we add the small coil coil domain tethered to the ER, glee is now in the cytoplasm and this can be quantified as well. So to summarize this uh, talk, we, uh, we, we started this project by asking, you know, can we learn something about how a kinesin interacts with the transcription factor and the mechanism by which uh, the, the cytoskeleton acts as a, as a 
tether in the cytoplasm for recruitment of transcription factor and, and regulation. And we stumbled upon some unexpected uh, findings that we had not anticipated. The first one was the mode of interaction. Uh, it, was, uh, it was interesting to see that Glee uses the same mode of mechanism that it uses to bind DNA uh, to, to bind the bind the kinesin, and in some ways, the kinesin just masquerades as a piece of DNA in the cytoplasm to uh, hold it uh, in the cytoplasm unless until it's properly activated. But it's not as simple as just forming a tether. What we, what we, what we see here is that uh, the uh, transcription factor actually is not just a passive cargo, but it regulates the amount of kinesin on the microtubules. So there's a feedback loop between the transcription factor concentration and, uh, and, and its localization to microtubules by changing the KIP7 microtubule interaction. And finally, this was sort of like a fun experiment that we did, but we are kind of excited about it now where uh, we want to see if we can build a tool to, uh, to, to, to to move and, and sequester the, the transcription factor away from the nucleus whenever we want to, in order to uh, answer questions pertaining to the cell biology of hedgehog signaling. And, and perhaps this, this will also be useful as a, as a way to control glee levels in cancer cells. So that's uh, the first story that I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about. And in the last 10 minutes or so, I will switch gears and I will tell you about uh, a, a direction that I never like anticipated I would like go in when I started my lab, but it's a uh, it's been a very fun uh, fun process and a very fun project. So I would love to share it with you. So you know, in in my lab, so one of the questions that I'm really interested in is how do you build these complex microtubule arrays and how are these complex arrays remodeled? Um, and, you know, when we think of dynamics of multi microtubule arrays, they, they fall into sort of two broad categories. So the first is sort of very large scale remodeling and disassembly where, so for example, every cell division, the spindle has to be disassembled and rebuilt, rebuilt. and similarly, the axoneme is disassembled and rebuilt every cell cycle. So these are very dramatic large scale events. And at the same time, there are dynamics on much finer scale to control the precise size and geometry of these structures. And, you know, one reaction that plays a role in both of these types of remodeling events is microtubule depolymerization. So this is a reaction where tubulin is lost from the ends of microtubules. And here you see a classic like textbook image of peeling microtubules from the ends of a, ends of a polymerized microtubule that leads to microtubule shortening. And so one of the questions in the field is basically, how is it that the same reaction, which is the loss of tubulin, gives rise to these two very different outcomes? And it's been anything to, to study with an array of microtubules has just been very complicated because of a technical challenge that I'll illustrate here. So on this slide on the left is a field of single microtubules. Uh, we've added a depolymerase and when we record uh, uh, this uh, depolymerization in real time, you can very nicely see every single microtubule undergoing depolymerization in, on this field. Now on the right is the same depolymerase, but we've added a crosslinker. So now we have a crosslink microtubule bundle. And I hope you can see that the intensity across the bundle uniformly drops, but there is no way to know where the ends of each microtubule is and how microtubules are bundled relative to each other. So when it comes to a microtubule array, we don't have a good way of looking at remodeling or destabilization in real time at the single microtubule resolution. Now, similarly, on another scale, the same problem exists. So now if we zoom into a single microtubule, there are all these protofilaments in the microtubule. So when the microtubule is depolymerizing, 
what is happening to every protofilament in real time is something that is not possible to, to image because of the resolution restrictions of uh, light microscopy. So a postdoc in my lab, Sitara Vijayaratne, thought, well, maybe we can use AFM to bridge this resolution gap between light and electron microscopy and perhaps try to, to, to image bundles of microtubules. So very briefly, AFM is it's a very simple technique in concept. It's simply a cantilever with a very sharp tip that is tapped along a surface. And any uh, obstruction uh, in the form of a sample leads to a deflection of the tip. And, and the deflection can be read out, giving a very fine detail of the surface topography. So the, the z-axis resolution in this method is actually much better than the x and y. So in this way, also, it complements some of the other methods we use in the lab. So this is just a single microtubule by atomic force microscopy. Uh, you can see actually like see all the protofilaments here uh, as they are at different heights from the mica surface on which the sample was adhered. Uh, it was a very exciting day for us because it took a while to get here. But this is not what we really wanted to do. What we really wanted to do was look at how bundles are organized. And can we really look at every microtubule in a bundle by this method? So we used a microtubule cross-linking protein called PRC1. Um, it's an anti-parallel microtubule cross-linking protein that has roles in uh, spindle organization. And here is an AFM image of a PRC1 crosslinked array. And you can probably see, uh, you know, so every rod here is a single microtubule. So it's, so it was, it would be, we could very nicely image microtubule arrays by AFM. But this is a static image, and that is not what we wanted to look at. Um, and so as our model system, we went to, we, we decided to start with deep polymerases. And we asked, can we look at the dynamics of individual microtubules in this array in real time when we add deep polymerases. And the deep polymerase we mostly chose to work with is this kinesin 13 called MCAC. And the only thing I would like to point out about this is this is a fast deep polymerase. It can depolymerize microtubules from both ends. Um, and the, it, and to just to have a comparison, we, we contrasted its activity with a different kinesin, which is a, a plus and directed motor that walks to the ends of microtubules and depolymerizes microtubules from the ends, one end of the microtubule. So, so these are the two kinesins, we depolymerizing kinesins we work with, but I will mostly focus on the kinesin 13 in the interest of time. So this is the first image that we acquired of a PRC1 crosslink bundle after adding MCAC. Uh, and so what you can see here, every, uh, right here, every large bun, every, every rod here is a microtubule, and this is color coded by height. And if you look at the regions that are highlighted in the white rectangles, you can see that you can see some stripiness, and these stripy features actually come from exposed protofilaments of partially depolymerized microtubules. So what we, and because there are different heights from the surface, and so now we can we, we were excited because we felt, okay, we could probably like see individual protofilaments within a microtubule within a larger array. This is now a 3D rendition of the same data. And as I play the movie, uh, I hope you can see, I, it would be easier if you focus on the, the pink arrows on the slide, where you can see depolymerization from the ends of microtubules and you can see individual protofilaments uh, being lost. And what we learned from this experiment was actually that the loss of protofilaments from a filament end is asynchronous. And that different protofilaments are actually lost at different rates with this depolymerase. And this uh, was uh, interesting because uh, nearly 20 years ago, using uh, artificial substrates, uh, people suggested that, that, uh, that MCAC might be able to use and recognize individual protofilaments as effective substrates, but there was no way to actually test that in the context of a microtubule, but this technique now gives us a, a tool to do that. 
Uh, we can also see propagation of lattice defects. These are now defects in the middle of the microtubule lattice. And we find that this enzyme can actually propagate these defects. Uh, and you can again see the stripiness and filament uh, based level depolymerization of the defects. So now I just want to contrast this with this other kinesin, kinesin 8. And I just will quickly summarize the, the main findings, which is that we do not see the stripy depolymerization. We do not see any defect propagation. Uh, and we uh, and we also see different dif differences in 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 you know, how it responds to PRC1 crosslinks, but I am not going to talk about that. Uh, but mostly, I would like to to uh, uh, emphasize the difference in the overall difference in depolymerization from the ends of microtubule and the middle of microtubule, suggesting that single protofilaments are probably not effective substrates for KIP3P, and KIP3P prefers to depolymerize from the ends. It does not propagate defects. So as you can imagine, proteins that are like MCAC are probably better suited to be large-scale remodelers, whereas those like KIP3, which act at the end, and do not cause destruction from the middle of the lattice are better suited to act as uh, fine tuners of microtubule length. So uh, we also wanted to ask what happens in the context of a different microtubule array. So how these, these experiments pointed to properties of the two kinesins being different at the level of the protofilament structural dynamic. So how does that translate to array remodeling of a completely different array? And here we decided to uh, look at axonemes. So axonemes are made of doublet microtubules, uh, and that is shown in the bottom right-hand side of the slide where there's a complete tubule. This is a side view where you see a co complete tubule, uh, and the, which is the A tubule, and a half tubule, which is called the B tubule. And the, and the junction between the A and B tubule is made up of a different protein. It's, it's a non-tubulin junction on the, on the top. So these doublet microtubules organize into this larger cylindrical array of nine microtubules, nine doublet microtubules uh, in the, at the circumference. Uh, so we wanted to ask, you know, can we image these by AFM? And axonemes look absolutely boring by AFM. They're featureless because they're quite tall for AFM. So that wasn't particularly interesting, but doublet microtubules have been imaged by AFM before. And we were able to find ways in which we could clearly distinguish the A and the B tubule uh, when, when they were on a mica surface. So again, we just like added the depolymerases and we asked what happens. So in order to do this experiment, we found that the best way to do it was to partially dissociate an axoneme so that it formed an axonemal array. This axonemal array is composed of doublet microtubules that are linked. So if you're on the right-hand side, the green and the pink in the zoomed in view highlight the doublets within each doublet, and then they're forming a larger array. And when, I have, when we add NCAC, I hope you can see that MCAC depolymerizes doublets and one tubule goes away faster than the other. And we think it's the B tubule that goes away first. Now this observation was exciting for a couple of different reasons to us. The first was that it was known that, you know, B tubules are less stable to things like high salt or, you know, some very uh, chemical and mechanical perturbations. But enzymatic depolymerization of doublets has never been looked at. And it was not even clear if these enzymes would these depolymerize these structures because they are some of the most stable microtubule structures that are seen in the cell. So we were, we were excited to find that in fact, it destabilizes microtubules and there is a difference in the rate at which B tubules are depolymerized with respect to A tubules which again points to interesting ways in which the size of different tubules in an axoneme could be differentially regulated by enzyme. So, but what happens in the context of an axoneme when there, there are linked doublets? So shown on the right, it's a schematic. So, so you know, in an axoneme, there are linked doublets. Uh, and we asked, okay, if 
B tubules go away first, then how is the axonemal stability impacted? And so on the left is a movie that I'm going to play. Uh, and as I said, axonemes are not pretty by AFM. But what we see is sort of this very dramatic uh, unfurling of the entire structure and very rapid sort of fall, it just falls apart. And we think it's because once the B tubules start to depolymerize, there is a loss in the linkages that hold the structure together. It's sort of like cutting the string that holds a bouquet together and the whole thing falls apart. And in the context of thinking about, you know, how a structure like the axoneme composed of lots of proteins that are like very, very stabilized uh, doublet microtubules, how, you know, if, if in terms of destabilizing such a structure, if we think of depolymerization from the end, slowly losing like different microtubules, it seems ineffective. So I think mechanisms like this might play a role in destabilizing the structure enough to then accelerate uh, the, the way in which the structure falls apart. Um, so in conclusion, we, we, we wanted to find a way to look at microtubule destabilization of arrays. And we essentially wanted a way to look at individual microtubules within arrays. And we, we asked the question, uh, you know, how, do, how, how are these arrays remodeled in different ways? Uh, can we visualize them and can we learn something about the mechanism underlying these processes? And we find that depolymerases that are as such really quite similar, they're both like kinase and depolymerases, they undergo two different, they can lead to very different outcomes. And we think that this depends on their activity at the protofilament level. So an enzyme that can effectively recognize and depolymerize individual protofilaments has a greater ability to disrupt the structure in a, an, a, in, in a more drastic way, whereas proteins that don't have that activity but have restricted activity to the ends are better suited to be length regulators. Um, and we can get insights into how, how such sort of dichotomy is, is built into uh, array remodeling by, by, by imaging them. Uh, so uh, I think I summarized all of this. Uh, so I will just uh, stop here. So I would like to thank our collaborator uh, funding sources, but uh, most importantly, I would like to thank my lab for uh, and all the people who were brave enough to join a, a, a new lab now a few years ago. And uh, these are like the first sort of stories from the lab. So I'm very excited to share them with you. So thank you and I'll take questions. Great, thank you, Radhika. That was an amazing talk. So um, I'm cl clapping <laughs> so people can, um, can uh, post uh, questions in the, in the chat and um, if you'd like to, I can call on you to um, to speak as if you have a question. Um, I guess I can start off. So I, oh, I guess Jill has a question. I see her hand. So, so Jill, do you want to go? Sure. That, that was a fantastic talk. I loved it. So I had a, the Glee story is really interesting. And the positions where glee binds are also really striking as well. And given that these are not really places where cargos typically bind to kinesin motors, I was wondering how glee binding, what the implications then might be for glee binding to kinesin when it might be KIF, when it might be attached to cargos. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so uh, I, I think- Oh, so oh sorry, sorry. I, Never mind. These are not. <laughs> How about if I don't say cargos, but when they might be um, bound to other proteins? Yeah. So, um, so you're talking about when the kinesin is bound to other proteins, and what are the implications? So, I, I think I think there is more going on with Kip Seven at the C terminus domain. So, there is actually a, a paper that suggests that. A, there, there is another cargo. Uh, I, I don't know whether to call it even a cargo, but um, it's a, there's another protein interaction site at the C terminus. And that is thought to be important for, for kinesin entry into the cilia. So, so there, is, there is 
there's more than one binding partner and uh, it remains to be seen how these different binding interactions all result in activation of the kinesin entry and glee binding and all of that, we don't know yet. So I had a question. So, so I noticed you had a KIF7 double knockout cell line. And so I was wondering what the, the phenotype was then for signaling. Um, so clearly like the cells are viable, but is there, what's the effect on the hedgehog signaling? Pathway. So the KIF7 knockout has hedgehog signaling defect. So in terms of the knockout mice, uh, they, it's not embryonically lethal. So the, but the, the, I guess the pups are sick and they die in a few weeks. So they have developmental defects that are all connected to hedgehog signaling defects. And then the, like the, the flip side of the question is, um, do all cells that have a a Glee 7 have like an axo or a um, like cilia, like some sort of comparable cellular structure? Yeah, so that, so, so whether there are more functions of KIF7 that are not hedgehog or cilia related, it's sort of an open question. So there is, there is a paper, there's exactly one paper uh, that talks about it and, and um, in, in, in some kind of a non-ciliated lung cell, they found that there are proliferation defects when KIF7 is absent, but that's the extent to which we understand anything about that. So we don't know. So KIF7 uh, is also a ciliogenesis factor. So if you don't have KIF7, uh, the, the, the cilia are found to be hyper elongated. Um, and that is consistent with some of our in vitro work suggesting that in addition to binding glee and all of that, it also regulates microtubule dynamics and it slows down microtubule growth. So it has multiple functions during ciliogenesis and, um, but the predominant phenotype in vivo in, in the mouse model were these hedgehog uh, related defects. Great, I think Scott has a question. Hello, I was, I really enjoyed it. I just had a question maybe more about the, the glee biology or the glee activation mechanism. So if it has to get transported from the base to the tip of the cilium in response to signal, and then something happens and it goes on to activate transcription, what exactly happens? And, um, <laughs> or if it's known, it might not be known. But what I wondered was like, it seems like one of those initially kind of like weird activation mechanisms, but I assume it takes some amount of time when a hedgehog signal is applied to get it to the tip. So is it like the length of the cilium ends up kind of setting like a threshold for how much sustained signal is needed to get it to the tip and get it activated? Or is there anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And uh, there isn't a very simple answer, but I'll, I'll do my best. So the, you know, so what sets the time? So it is found that it takes about three to four hours for glee to be maximally at the tip of the cilia. And so, so what happens at the, and, and this is, um, uh, but, but, you know, it's, it's, there's an increase and then it maximizes that at about that time. And it correlates with the amount of time it takes to fully dephosphorylate glee, which is, so multiple things happen. Glee activation is not one step. There is dephosphorylation of glee. Glee is at the tip of the cilia. It has a repressor called suppressor of fuse that needs to fall off the, the transcription factor. And then I completely ignored the membrane, but there are proteins bound on the membrane. Like there is receptor-based activation mechanisms that, that, that have to do with ensuring. So the full length unproteolized dephosphorylated form of glee is thought to be the fully activated form. And when this protein is either proteolytically degraded or it can be degraded to a repressor form that forms a repressor at the base of the cilia. So there is a lot of things that need to happen, like the ubiquitination system has to be uh, suppressed to prevent degradation. And uh, you know, the activation by loss of SUFU needs to occur. So, um, so but I, I don't think the length of the cilia sets the, sets the threshold because it's not even clear if it's actively 
you know, transported or if it's more like a diffusion and capture because kine the KIP7 doesn't walk uh, on microtubules and the cilia is quite short. So I, I find the, you know, motility model a little bit difficult to understand. Or, uh, so, so I, but, but what is thought, what, what is speculated is that the volume of the cilia is what does the trick. So you were taking very low copy, they're so low copy number that it's kind of a pain to do any like cellular imaging, taking these very low copy number proteins and like putting it and concentrating it in this very small volume. And this concentration of all the factors at the same time in this concentrated volume is what results in uh, complete deactivation. But it's, yeah, it's there, there's a lot of question mark there. I, I think uh, Judith had a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I also really loved your talk. It was really gorgeous. And I had tons of questions. But, um, so am I right in, in thinking that KIF7 is not in the cilium until signaling? Did you say that? And then it. So uh, I, I didn't go over that in detail, but the answer is that KIF7 is at low levels. And its level increases when the pathway turns on. Okay. So, it, so it must be somewhere else. <laughs> That's the deduction I, I drew in my mind. And does that mean, is it possible it's acting as a DNA mimic for other transcription factors? Yeah, so we are, we are very curious about, you know, because if it's binding a zinc finger domain, then it might be able to bind other tandem zinc finger repeats. And I don't have an answer to your question. So in a KIF7 proteomic study, there were a couple of other zinc finger proteins that were reported. We don't, we'll have to verify that biochemically. Uh, and we're also thinking that it might be fun to just see if we can do some kind of a cross-linking pull down to see, you know, what, if you just have the small domain and overexpress it, what are the different proteins that it can pull along with it? Um, so yeah, and also the question in reverse, which is that, you know, are there other kinesins or coil coil proteins out there that do this? And is this a, because the cytoskeleton is full of coil coil domains. So that's sort of an intriguing idea. And I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that yet. I'll let someone else uh, ask a question. I have I have tons of questions, but I gather we're having cocktails, so I can ask. Yeah. <laughs> so, so does anyone else have a question? I'll, I'll 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 ask one more. Then, if someone thinks of one, then then they can jump in. So so, uh, zinc finger domains can also bind RNA, and. <laughs> You know, transcription is great and all, but, but RNA <laughs> binding and transport could be could be where it's at. Um, so, 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 you know, as a lot of RNA binding proteins contain tandem nucleic acid binding motifs, and so I could easily envision some of these interacting with a kinesin, and the others interacting with their cognate RNA. And so, I'm I, I just wanted to throw that idea out there that um, yes yes Aaron we haven't ignored our day it's like <laughs> <laughs> so I I've been thinking about it but I I don't I don't have you know any any data or anything but you know I, I was thinking about it like particularly in the context of things like neuronal transport where there's like RNA is a cargo and you know we always think of cargo and cargo adapters and and such but but perhaps that's not needed. Maybe you know the the kinesins, the kinesins themselves act as a scaffold for. Mm -hmm. um, so we we find some coils. So we've actually now looked at a lot of different coil coils, and then there are coil coils that have a very positively charged surface. So I all also feel like, like you know. Um, so so you know one idea is that the RNA binding proteins could bind these protein domains, but it could also be, I, I wonder if there could be direct like nucleic acid binding yeah. to the protein. Like, I, I have no idea, but just. Cool. Can I ask one more question? <laughs> Nobody else is, is, 
um, from it. So I, I was really curious about the activation mechanism and, of, of glee. And you say it has to go up to the tip and be concentrated. And presumably it's, you know, for the act, whatever this activation mechanism, it, it then presumably binds there and is concentrated there. So how is it released? Yeah, <laughs> that is, that is a really great question for which I have no great answer, but uh, there has to be a way in which this, this interaction has to be broken. And so we are now doing some experiments where we are building this reconstitution. So one idea is that there is a, there's a suppressor uh, that binds glee in general, so the suppressor of fuse. And there is this three protein complex. And it's possible that the, that there is some multi-protein interaction that changes the KD of the uh, kinesins interaction with the transcription factor. The other thing that happens is the dephosphorylations. And a lot of the phosphorylation sites are flanking the kinesin binding sites on Glee. So uh, I think the sort of the two next steps is to, to add the other major suppressor of the pathway and then the third and, and, and to add the kinase and look at how those change uh, the interaction affinities to get at some idea of release mechanism. Very cool. Thank you. Thanks for a great seminar. So, so, so why don't we end there? So, so Radhika has a few minutes to relax before the meeting with the students. Um, so let's all thank Radhika for the, the great talk.